Well, let's start the discussion in spite of the merits of challenges that have confronted the Nigerian economy this year amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Economists have expressed optimism that the country's economy will expand in the coming years through, especially through structural and policy reforms capable of unlocking and driving economic growth. According to a group of Nigerian economists in a 2020 microeconomic outlook, projected that the nation's economy is expected to grow 2.37% in 2022, following improved improvement in the non-oil sector and further expansion in fiscal deficits despite plans to remove subsidy. They expressed a cautious optimism uh, over the possible flotation of the Naira in 2022 due to the possible delay in Dangote refinery completion. However, they expect the CBN to monitor FX savings from the project before altering its policy regime. It will be recalled that International Monetary Fund, in its October Regional Economic Outlook for Sub-Saharan Africa, predicted an address economy to grow by 2.7% in 2022 on the premise of higher oil prices and recovery on non-oil sector. Well, joining me now live uh, from Abuja to talk more about this development is a senior economist and partner at our SPM Professionals, Mr. Paul Alaji. Good afternoon, Mr. Alaji, and thank you very much for your time. Hello, can we? I think we're trying to connect. Uh, with Mr. Paul. Mr. Paul, can you hear me? Me? I can hear you loud and clear. Great. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate this. Uh, there is a recent report, like I said earlier, by a research firm projecting 2.37% expansion of Nigeria's economy next year. Let's start with what's your reaction to this? Okay, so for next year, um, there have been a lot of reports, including that of IMF staffs, uh, which says that, yes, Nigeria may go back to the pre-COVID growth, uh, but the growth will still be very, very weak because of institutional uh, and structural challenges that we are faced with. So the new report talking about 2.3 uh, to 2.4% GDP growth rate is within the boundaries of what is expected uh, that Nigeria should grow. Uh, the challenge here is that it's below the population growth rate, but of course it's expected that we will grow uh, within that range of 2.38% uh, or a bit above 2.3% uh, GDP growth rate for next year. Hmm. Well, details of the report shows that subsidy removal may be halted as a result of the forthcoming election. I talked about this somewhere earlier today. Uh, what do you think uh, about that before we talk about inflation and other issues around in the rising crude oil prices well if you if you recall that i spoke with you sometime around june or july uh, regarding subsidy removal when it came uh, at a conversation and i said that i doubt the, the if nigeria authority will be willing to remove subsidy completely the pressure the politics and the implication the pressure from the people, particularly from labor force, is, and especially from the entire Nigerian people, because of the implications of, uh, of uh, removal of subsidy, it will lead to inflation. Or like the report from IMF that reported 2.5% increase in inflation, I doubt that so much, because over the years, when subsidy has been removed, inflation has not increased by less than 3 to about 6%. The tremendous impact is not what we can manage with 15.99, approximately 16% inflation rate. It, it's quite high, and I think uh, the real thing should be uh, the conversation. When you ask me, that how do I feel about government or, I mean, wanting to uh, stop the decision of subsidy removal? First thing I will tell you is that we cannot remove subsidy if we have not created an efficient supply side. Why do we have subsidy? We have subsidy because of so many factors. Today, because we don't have a supply side, a local supply side I mean, by the way, because perhaps all the PMS we consume in Nigeria are imported. We have abundance, at least the crude oil that is sufficient for our country to consume, but because we don't refine, 
So you cannot say we should clap with one hand. We have an effective demand locally, but we don't have a sufficient, we don't have a local supply for a commodity that we call energy, that drives our businesses, that drives our home. We understand the state of even power supply. That's why people must buy for their generator. Some organization are running on PMS. So it's a bit of concern as we speak right now. So leave that on one hand. On the second hand, the question is, where is the supply? If anything happens to exchange rate tomorrow, and we say we want the forces of demand and supply to adjudicate price, how exactly will that be if Naira falls to the dollar, which has been the practice in the last 10 years, in the last 20, 30 years, we have seen consistent devaluation of the Naira. If that happens, are we saying that people will be ready to pay more for economic sins they have not committed? That is point number two. Point number three is that if we say we want to devalue, we, we, we want to remove subsidy today, imagine that we had the same exchange rate as we had in 2014 or in 2010. So if you remove subsidy, the price should not be 300 and something. It should actually be about 100 naira. Poor management of economy as evident in monetary sluggishness and fiscal concerns it's why prices will go as high as 300 naira or 320, as the case may be. In our own opinion, we strongly believe that subsidy could be removed, but that should be done when we have sufficient supply, at least what meets up with our local demand. So that cost of transport, shipping out crude oil, and bringing it back to the country for us to consume would have been completely eliminated. And how do we do this? Modular refineries. The money that has been mentioned that we want to spend on 5,000 5, naira for about 40 million homes could be loans to people that want to build modular refineries within a year. If that is done, we are going to have some level of output. We have also heard that a private refinery, perhaps the largest in West Africa or Africa, is also coming mainstream next year. We have four uh, public refinery, government-owned refinery, that we have tried to turn around but refused to turn like Baba's chair. They remain on the same spot, gulping money from us as a country. Those refineries, if cannot be managed by government, it's better we give to private sector. By all means, let supply outweigh demand so that Nigerians will not need to pay for what they are not enjoying value for. I want to stay a bit with the Forex issue. I know we can't talk about this enough. We've been talking so much about this, and we see the efforts of the central bank. It's been continuous supporting that uh, segment of the market, you know, and one way or the other, being able to keep that, uh, the exchange rate. It's been hovering between 550, 570, that's on the other side, and uh, the R&E window. Now, what do you think, moving on, you touched on uh, flotation, allowing market forces to determine, do you think we can do that at the moment? Okay, so I never said we should allow market forces to determine prices. No, I it's said like you mentioned. Mr. I said you mentioned. To fight Anthony Joshua. Okay, I said you mentioned. You just mentioned okay, issues no, I, around that. I got that. your yes. point. Yes. <laughs> no, Go I ahead. Got I got your question very well, yeah. but I'm just saying it for emphasis. Okay, good. If you say demand and supply should educate price, it's like saying Anthony Joshua should fight Mr. Macaroni in a boxing uh, 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 game. You all know the result, but if it is comedy, definitely Mr. Macaroni may win. But that is, by the way, going to the real issue. I am saying that before you allow the forces of demand and supply to adjudicate price, we need to have a functional supply side. I give you one of the economic mistakes we have made. If you say you want, look at electricity for instance. We, we said we are privatized to so the discos, the jenkos. If you don't, if you are living on the uh, mainland in Lagos and you don't want to use Ikeja Electric, which other option do you have? You are faced with a monopoly. If Ikeja Electric refuse to connect your, your meter that is faulty, for no fault of yours, you would have to wait at their mercy. Which other option do you have? If you go to the island and without, you say you don't want to use the co-electric, which other option do you have? So if you say we want to privatize, there should be that presence of competitiveness, which is not there in power sector, and we may introduce the same thing in PMS. And this is my worry. If we continue to do that, if anything happens to exchange rate, Nigeria just needs to prepare to pay for more. 
I understand as the price of crude oil globally is increasing, the cost of subsidy in Nigeria will keep increasing. How do we remove that? It's by making refinery function locally. This is a lasting solution. It's the solution we have presented to leaders time and again in the country, and I hope that this time we are going to do the right thing once and for all. Hmm. Let's now look at monetary policy stance, uh, Mr. Paul. Uh, it's something that um, uh, worries me. We see how the committee has been grappling with maintaining rates for some time. Uh, do you think there could be a shift anytime soon in our monetary policy uh, in Nigeria? Well, I doubt. I doubt because inflation is still high, double digits, as against central bank target, uh, six to nine percent single digit. We are still on double digits, and it's not even weak double digits. It's strong double digits at approximately sixteen percent, properly speaking, fifteen point nine nine percent. Unemployment, whether we say monetary authority are responsible for that or not, is one of the macroeconomic variables that must be considered. And mild employment rate is about thirty-three percent, not of a strong labor force, of a smaller labor force of about uh, approximately 70 million people, and that is just being charitable, of out of a population of over 200 million people. That we worry anybody. Look at uh, growth. Growth seems to have surged from uh, negative 33 now to about 4.03%. I mean, but when you compare the base year, the base year that we compared that with was the weakest in about 10 to 20 years of minus 6%. Therefore, if you see that we are having a positive uh, growth and uh, we should advise Monetary Policy Committee to quickly vary uh, the, the, the rate, then I think it will be a mistake. For now, and even in the next committee meeting, I think Monetary Policy Committee should not make so significant change until we have rested towards the second quarter of next year, except if there are other economic uh, occurrences that we don't see today or we have not uh, envisaged that we happen today, at that time, Monetary Policy Committee may be making a different, may take a different stand. But as of now, I think the best decision that could be made by any Monetary Policy Committee, given our economic outlook, weak uh, employment market, uh, high inflation, high poverty, hunger, business environment is also weak. Recall that we started this with locking down uh, the borders uh, sometimes a few years ago, and that now uh, extended, started driving inflation up, which Monetary Policy Committee even told government at a time that we may need to recheck some of these decisions. COVID came, struck hard, may, uh, uh, ensure we had both demand shock and supply shock, and eventually market shock, which had implication in driving about 7 million people, fresh people into poverty, according to World Bank report. So for me, I think Monetary Policy Committee is just observing the economy and the direction is going so that we can have a, a relative balanced economy, quote and unquote, because as we speak, it's still a tough time. Hmm, really a tough time and with the drama surrounding the omicron variant uh, mr paul that's another one we have to grapple with the cup is so filled now what does it look like when talking about the external market uh with uh in 2022 with regards to the omicron variant well uh you recall that we do not have control over external my external occurrence such as covid with omicron uh nigeria has been affected and i'm happy that nigerian government is also trying to push back uh to countries that have issued travel ban quote and unquote to nigeria uh, because when you look at the numbers confirmed cases in nigeria compared to some of these countries that have said nigeria could not get into their country you see that our number is even better compared to the entire population i am not saying that nigeria should do the wrong thing. If Nigerians are not testing properly, I think it's important that government to become more decisive in ensuring that testing is as is improved. That's on one hand. On the second hand, government may also need to ensure that uh, those that have been vaccinated are getting true vaccination, are getting true vaccination, and they are getting it from correct sources. So those are the two assignments the Nigerian government should do. We do, and I've also seen the effort of the the presidential committee on COVID-19 to ensure that Nigeria come out of this. But if you have more and more cases of COVID, one variant uh, seems to be disappearing. 
appearing new one coming it means the world cannot get back uh, to our feet the way it was before pre-covid on time therefore we need lasting solution either it's going to come through vaccine or it's going to come through other measure or non pharmaceutical approach we need a lasting solution because it is obvious to all of us that the world cannot afford another lockdown for a long time the implication on Africa is still there. The implication, even on the rest of the world, some economy are still posting very weak, very poor GDP figures. Some economy are just coming out of recession. Some are still there. To say we should go back into the lockdown would definitely be a no answer. And I'm happy that the Nigerian government listened. You know, after testing first week, second week, third week, fourth week, about sixth week, I am so happy that the Nigerian government listened. The part we need Nigerian government to do now is to enforce compliance with wearing off masks and so many other things, especially in public places, so that we can protect more lives and property while we, don't, while we refuse to sacrifice our economy on the altar of COVID-19. I'm going to take you back to something we've talked about, which is the issue of subsidy. Mr. Paul, I I'd like us to stay a little bit on issues around subsidy for now. Uh, elections will be just in two years. By 2022, it will be next year. And many believe uh, the plan to face out subsidy uh, might make any party become unpopular. So that argument becomes that what do you think government will do? Clearly, we cannot sustain this the way it looks. So what are the ways, let me ask this way, what are the right ways to go about this so that we don't continue to border in the country enough of debts already? Well, I think the first thing government needs to do is to create supply side. Uh, we are looking at about 2.4 trillion. Instead of giving that money to people who we call poor, and the challenges we're giving to the poor is that the total number of people we give here in Nigeria are less than 60 million, approximately 50, close to about 60 million people. Many of them are not within the very poor bracket that the uh, minister is targeting. How will you transfer money to them now that we say the money will be trolley via transfer and they don't have bank accounts? I've been to a number of states in Nigeria, virtually most of the states have been there. I've seen several local governments without any banking presence. How would you, people that have no BVN, transfer 5,000 naira to them for a period of six months to one year. Clearly, it is, a, it is a tough task for governments to do today. Therefore, what should we do? The problem is not the 5,000 we want to transfer. The real problem here is to ensure that the well, I mean, PMS gets to Nigeria or is available in Nigeria at lower price so that it can be sold, it can be made available to people to consume at the same low price. So what should we do? Supply. Remove the cost of transporting fuel to Nigeria, exporting and bringing back. If government even wants to give subsidy, it should not be on PMS, it should be on what production can be added to, not direct consumption. So the supply side is our real issue. And until we are able to create that effective supply side, anybody talking about subsidy will not be fear, subsidy removal, I beg your pardon, will not be fear on Nigerians. And when you look at telecom sector, people have said, let's quickly remove this, let go many visa like telecom. Why have we not been able to repeat it with power sector? We achieve it with telecom, we are not able to achieve it with the power because I don't know whether you are running on generator right now. Because if, you, if it was that efficient, we have different organization with telecom. So I don't know whether it's also going to be efficient with power. For me, I don't think it has been efficient. And the same mistake may be repeated with removal of subsidy. So what should we do? Supply side that can make room for competition. Even if you have the largest refineries owned by one man, it's not sufficient. The fate of the people will depend on that individual or that sole company. Therefore, 2.4 trillion thereabout that government wants to spend should be given to those who want to create modular refineries. And they can get about 10 of them with that money. Within a year, government, we, I mean, we cannot be looking at withdrawal subsidy gradually. If we do it today, there will be pressure from labor. If labor refuses to act, there will be pressure for quite uh, a lot of Nigerians. Recall that 2012, the argument went beyond labor. Labor was somewhere in Abuja, somewhere around Bega. But you saw different Nigerians in Lagos, on the street of Kano, on the, on the street of Kwara, you know, protesting, not because they were completely coordinated by labor. Therefore, for us not to shut down the economy for a longer time, recall that we just came from COVID and the test is still bitter. To say we want to remove subsidy, 
election is here, the party that removed subsidy at that time never returned to office. <laughs> and this is what I've seen consistently. Anyone that wants to push subsidy up to 60 cents at parallel market window continue to have political concerns. Now, if we want to give 5,000 to people, let me tell you some of the good things the minister have done. The minister have passed in a long time, and I've not seen a minister achieve this in recent time, passed Finance Act. And it's also working on Finance Act 2021. This is some of the good things this current minister have done. She's planned it, she saw it through, and it became the law. If we are talking of 5,000, politician will seize the opportunity to make it election money for people. Unfortunately, the goal, the, 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 the interest of the minister to genuinely help people may not be achieved because it will now come to, the money should go to certain constituencies, etc., etc. And that may even put us in a bigger problem because it will increase supply of money and may lead to higher inflation. So the value for the money that has been collected at the end of the day, we ask question, how have we been able to implement it? So what should we do? We need to hold on. That's the truth. It may, people may not want to say, hold on, let supply side either through modular refinery be created or one hand, or we wait for the ongoing private refinery being constructed to be created, or government hand over the refiners. We hear government is having partnership on one of the refineries with private sector. How much of that has been done? Energy should be on making refineries work. If refineries are working and people can see that our supply outweigh our demand, at that time is when demand and supply can adjudicate price. Say we should consume at home and import. When we know that exchange rate risks become concern of the people, it will be doing injustice to Nigerians at large. Honestly, it's always interesting talking to you, Mr. Paul Alaji, and time really flies. I must thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. It's always, it's always a pleasure. Saying it the way it is. I've been speaking to Mr. Paul uh, Alaji. He's a partner and senior economist at SPM Professionals. Do enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so very much for having me.